let's talk about the uh, physical models of binary compact objects. And I will highlight, mainly highlight the uncertainties and the open issues. So we'll first briefly summarize what we learned from gravitational wave detections. And then I will focus on uh, the mass of compact objects, the formation channels of binary compact objects, and our future challenges. So I start from this plot, which is a summary of the masses of neutron stars and black holes for which we have a good mass measurement. And starting from the bottom, if you can see my mouse, these blue dots are neutron stars, either from uh, gravitational wave events or from uh, pulsar, uh, radio pulsars in binary systems. Uh, then these uh, turquoise points are black holes in nearby binaries for which we have a dynamical mass measurement. And finally, the orange dots that are quite numerous uh, are uh, black holes in binary black holes uh, that we observe as gravitational wave events. And now I highlight on top of this plot uh, the uh, so-called lower and upper mass gap. Uh, the lower mass gap is between about two and five solar masses and has been claimed uh, based on the observations of uh, nearby uh, neutron stars and, and black holes from X-ray binaries and the lack of uh, neutron stars and black holes in this region. Uh, while the upper mass gap is between about 60 and 120 solar masses, and uh, it is expected from theory, from the theory of pair instability that we will discuss more in a few slides. And uh, while the lower mass gap is still quite a gap, so there are very uh, few objects inside, uh, the upper mass gap starts to be quite crowded of orange dots, uh, but most of them are actually uh, merge remnants. So they are the result of the merger of two small black holes uh, that, and then those black holes don't come from uh, stellar collapse. Uh, but there are a few events right here where uh, the primary component is inside uh, the upper mass gap. So uh, the questions we will discuss in the next few slides are what drives the mass function of compact objects? And they're really an upper mass gap and or a lower mass gap. So first of all, um, from a theoretical perspective, an astrophysical perspective, we think that the mass of a compact object uh, is determined from uh, the properties of, by the properties of the stellar progenitor, and in particular by the mass of the stellar progenitor. A massive star, which is the progenitor of a neutron star or a black hole, uh, does not evolve with a constant mass. If it is a single massive star, it tends to lose mass during its life by a process called stellar winds, which is basically um, due to the coupling between ions and photons at the stellar surface, uh, leading to mass loss. And stellar winds for massive hot stars, which are the progenitors of black holes, uh, strongly depend on a metallicity and on the luminosity of the star. And the lower the metallicity is, uh, the lower the mass loss rate uh, during the life of the star, and the higher the luminosity of the star, the higher the mass loss rate, basically regardless of the metallicity. And if we um, take one of the most recent models for stellar winds and we combine it with a stellar evolution model, uh, then we can um, uh, model the evolution of a mass star, as you can see in this plot. Uh, this shows the evolution of the mass of a star as a function of time. We start with a 90 solar mass, which is a very massive star, uh, definitely a black hole progenitor, and we evolve it with seven 
different metallicities. And the red line is solar metallicity, which is quite high. And you see that the star loses more than half of its mass during its life. Well, at low metallicity, the star can retain most of its mass. And the right-hand side of this plot uh, shows the final mass of the star, which is the mass at the onset of core collapse, uh, which is very important because when we want to model the final fate of a star, so the core collapse of a massive star, uh, the fundamental question we should ask is, does this star explode as a successful core collapse supernova? And if we find out that the answer is yes, then the star loses most of its mass during the explosion, and it's going to leave uh, either a neutron star or a low mass black hole. While if uh, we find out that the answer is no, then the star collapses to a black hole quietly without an explosion, and the mass of the black hole will be massive, close to the final mass of the star. Now, since uh, uh, metal poor stars tend to have higher final masses than metal rich ones, then they are also more likely to avoid a supernova and uh, produce more massive black holes via direct collapse. And this is the basic idea behind this kind of models. Uh, so this plot shows uh, the expected mass of the compact object, of the compact remnant um, from the model, as a function of the initial mass of the progenitor star. We call it zero h mean sequence mass of the progenitor star for several different metallicities. And the bottom line is that uh, the lower the metallicity is, the higher the maximum possible mass of the compact object of the black hole uh, because of the interplay between star winds and core collapse supernovae that I just described. Uh, but in this kind of plot, uh, we neglect one crucial uh, physical process, which is pairing stability. So let me briefly summarize uh, it. Uh, when a star is very massive and metal poor, uh, after carbon burning, uh, it reaches a, a core, a helium core, and some central properties like the temperature, central temperature of the star, and the central density of the star uh, that lead to a efficient production of gamma ray photons. And these gamma ray photons end up forming uh, pairs, electron positron pairs, uh, which trigger an instability called pair instability. And, and the reason for this instability is that the formation of the pairs uh, removes uh, photon pressure from the core, uh, leading to a contraction of the core. And this instability has a huge impact on the final mass of the compact object. And this plot here is an example of this impact. So here we show again the usual uh, expected mass of the compact remnant uh, versus the initial mass of the star for different metallicities of the star. Uh, but here we add on top of our model a formalism for pairing stability. And we see that there are a lot of new features. So if we consider the most metal poor stars, so the blue and violet line here, we see that there is a range between approximately 110 and 230 solar masses, where we expect no compact object, no compact remnant, because uh, pairing stability, the pairing stability produces a supernova that completely destroys the star, leaving no compact object. And uh, this regime, of course, depends on the metallicity, so the range becomes narrower and narrower for higher metallicities and even disappears at some point because the central temperature, the central properties of the star depend on metallicity. Here, 
at lower metallicity, we do expect the formation of black holes, uh, but the maximum mass is only about 60 solar masses, while in this case, without uh, pre-stability, uh, we have also black holes with mass of 70, 80 solar masses. And the reason is that here, very instability triggers pulsations, and the stars shed a lot of mass during these pulsations, so it forms a black hole, but with a lower mass than uh, uh, without peristability. And then finally, for very, very massive stars and extremely metal poor, like this one, uh, peristability triggers the direct collapse because the gravity of the outer layers of the star is so strong that the star just collapses, producing a, a massive black hole. And here we have the first issue because one of the main features of the uh, process of pair instability in this plot is that we expect it to open a gap between about 60 and 120 solar masses, the mass gap or the upper mass gap of black hole mass spectrum that we mentioned before. But uh, the primary mass of one of the uh, binary system observed by LIGO and Virgo 1905-21, and now also of other possible candidates, uh, the primary masses of these systems lie right in the middle of this uh, uh, mass gap. And so how can we explain this uh, issue? The first uh, and obvious uh, um, question is how confident are we about the boundaries of the mass gap? And there was a lot of work in the last uh, two or three years uh, about uh, this issue. Uh, here I, uh, I pasted just some of the uh, most important works. Um, and I selected two figures from two of this work. Uh, so, um, the bottom line is that the mass gap can be influenced by uncertainties on reaction rates, on the treatment of overshooting, which is another fundamental process, on the treatment of rotation, convection, or uh, the uh, properties of the collapse. And in this plot here, uh, the authors show the expected mass of the black hole uh, versus the um, uh, value of the uh, reaction rate for the carbon alpha nuclear reaction rate, this one, uh, which is very important for massive stars, but also very difficult to uh, measure. And uh, considering the uh, rate uh, plus or minus three sigma, the measured rate plus or minus three sigma, uh, a farmer and collaborators showed that a mass gap, which is indicated uh, by this white stripe, uh, shifts considerably. And the situation is even more complicated, as you can see here, uh, where we show the mass of the black hole as a function of the initial mass of the star, and the different colors are, again, different rates of the carbon alpha reaction, uh, while the dashed and solid line represent basically the uncertainty on the final collapse. So the dotted line here uh, shows the pessimistic case in which only the helium core collapses to a black hole, uh, while the solid line is the optimistic case in which even a part of the envelope, the residual hydrogen rich envelope of the star can collapse to a black hole. And the realistic case is probably in the middle between the two lines because the hydrogen rich envelope is very loosely bound and a fraction of it can be ejected even without a supernova. And you see that for the um, pessimistic case of the helium collapse only, the uh, maximum mass of the black hole is less than about 60 solar masses, while 
if we allow the envelope to collapse, uh, we can produce uh, uh, black holes with mass as high as 80, 90 solar masses with just a mildly low rate of the carbon alpha. And the mass gap becomes narrower and narrower when we consider smaller values of this rate, and it even uh, disappears completely for the minus, minus three sigma case. Uh, so the bottom line is that the predictive power of our model is uh, really poor. We still have a lot of uncertainties on the upper mass cap. What about the lower mass cap? Well, um, the uncertainties are even bigger because in this case, the existence of uh, the lower mass gap from a theoretical perspective depends on the uh, core collapse supernova. And this plot shows the expected mass of the compact remnant versus initial mass of the star if we zoom in in the transition region between neutron stars and black holes. And by comparing four models of core collapse supernovae. And the uncertainty really ranges from models uh, like the black one that predict no gap at all, and the other models that um, produce a stronger and stronger mass gap. Uh, and the situation is even more complex than the one that I, I just highlighted, because uh, in the first part of my talk, I just discussed the formation of a single neutron star or a single black hole from a single star. Uh, but LIGO and VIR observe binary systems of black holes or neutron stars that merge within the lifetime of the universe and that we can observe. So how do we produce these exotic systems? Uh, in the next few slides, I will review uh, two of the most popular scenarios which are the isolated binary evolution and the dynamical channel. And I will discuss the main uncertainties. So uh, the idea of the isolated binary evolution is pretty uh, straightforward. I start from two massive stars. Uh, they are bound members of binary system since their formation, and they evolve into two neutron stars or two black holes that merge. Uh, and this seems uh, natural because we do observe massive stars in the local universe and they form, they are preferentially uh, members of binary systems or multiple systems. But the evolution of a tight binary system is affected by a plethora of physical processes that can completely change the final fate of the system and are uh, difficult. Uh, terribly difficult to model, like mass transfer between the two stars or a common envelope or tides. And I picked up just one case, the case of common envelope, uh, to give you an idea of this kind of processes. So uh, with this cartoon, here we start on the left with binary system that is composed of a black hole and a uh, hydrogen rich star, which is a main sequence star. When the companion evolves because it stops burning hydrogen in the core, uh, it inflates its radius grows, and the envelope of the companion may engulf the black hole. Uh, so we have a common envelope phase in which the black hole and the core of the companion orbit about each other inside the same stellar envelope. And they feel gas drag from the envelope that removes kinetic energy from their orbit. And so the black hole and the uh, core of the companion spiral in. If this spiral in is not interrupted, then the black hole merges with a companion, and this uh, leaves a single black hole without uh, detectable gravitational wave emission. While if the energy transferred from the um, inner binary to the envelope is sufficient to unbind the envelope, then we are left with a completely new binary system composed of a black hole 
and the core of the previous companion. And the orbital separation of the binary is orders of magnitude shorter than it was at the beginning because of the spiraling. So this is a very good candidate to become a binary black hole that merges within the lifetime of the universe and that we can observe. And a similar, um, a similar process applies to binary neutron star candidates too. But the problem is that we do not understand uh, the details of the physics of common envelopes. So most models, we have to encode the physics that we do not understand in a free parameter that is called the ejection of common envelope. And in this plot here, I show you an example of what we can do with these simulations that uh, include uh, this modeling of the common envelope with one free parameter plus several additional parameters from other processes. And um, this uh, plot that you see comes from uh, the simulation of 100 million uh, binary stars, massive binary stars, from which we extract the properties of the binary black holes that form the different colors uh, uh, refer to different metallicities of the progenitor stars. Um, and uh, this plot shows the total mass of the binary black holes that form from this star. So mass of black hole one plus mass of black hole two. And the only difference between the top and the bottom panel is that in the panel, we show all the binary black holes that we form, while in the bottom panel, we show those systems that merge uh, within lifetime of the universe. And you see that there is a huge difference. Here, we reach uh, total black hole masses of about 130 solar masses, while here, the maximum mass is, total mass is only about 85 solar masses. And the reason for this difference is that a uh, common envelope or mass transfer uh, remove a lot of mass from the progenitor stars in this uh, uh, tight binary system and only leave smaller black holes. And now, so far, I have only discussed masses, but there is another crucial uh, property of compact objects that we must model and understand, uh, which are spins. And if we look at the spins of black holes, we have a problem because observations of black holes in gravitational wave events support relatively low, spin, uh, low spins for most black holes, while some black holes in uh, nearby X-ray binaries are extremely fast spinning. As you can see from this nice plot, Maya will add more details about it later on. It shows the distribution fraction, cumulative distribution fraction of the spins of black holes. The orange is for uh, gravitational wave events and the other colors for black holes in X-ray binaries. So these two are definitely two different populations. And how can we explain these two different populations? The honest answer is that we do not know how to explain these two different populations. We think that the spin of black hole or a neutron star should be related to the final spin of the core of the progenitor star, but the problem is that we do not know how efficient is angular momentum transport from the stellar core to the envelope during stellar life, because if it is inefficient, then you, you can produce a population of fast spinning black holes. If it is efficient, we will produce slow spinning black holes. And there are several models like the Taylor Spruit Dynamo that I showed here that predict different spin distributions for black holes. So for example, in this case of the uh, models by Fuller and collaborators, uh, the expectation is that the uh, final spins of the cores of single stars are very low and so consistent with the observations of gravitational waves. But then we have a problem. If all the black holes are not spinning like that, how can we explain the spins in X-ray binaries? 
And there are some possible way outs. So for example, um, the chemically homogeneous evolution, which is another uh, possible evolution in a binary system can produce fast spinning black holes or tidal interactions in a binary system can spin up the uh, companion. So the second born black hole is fast spinning. Uh, to give, uh, but if we do not understand the spin magnitudes, at least we understand reasonably well the orientation of the spins. So in a binary stars, the spin of the two stars tend to be aligned with the orbital angular momentum of the binary by tides and mass transfer. And all the supernova explosion can significantly misalign the spins because as you see in this cartoon, it tilts the orbital plane. So to give you a take home message from isolated binary evolution, we expect from isolated binaries, we expect relatively low mass binary black holes and binary neutron stars. Uh, but we should not forget about the large uncertainties from stellar evolution. We definitely do not understand the magnitudes of the spins, and we expect that the directions of the spins to be partially aligned with the orbital angular moment of the binary system. So what about dynamics now? Uh, for dynamics, I mean close encounters between stars and black holes, which happen only if the uh, density of the environment is high, more than a thousand stars per cubic parsec. Uh, this is possible on, in extremely dense environment like stellar clusters. And what are the uh, dynamical processes that affect the formation of binary compact objects? Um, uh, we know a plethora of them, uh, but I will just mention a few of them for the sake of bravery. And one is uh, exchanges. So with this cartoon, uh, suppose we have a binary system composed of a black hole and a low mass star, like a solar mass star, this is not going to become a binary black hole. But if it is in the middle, of a dense stellar cluster, then it can interact with other stars and black holes. And a black hole may kick off the Loma star and give birth to a binary black hole via dynamical exchange. And black holes are expected to be efficient in pairing up like that because exchanges favor the formation of more massive binaries, which are more energetically stable. Uh, while neutron stars are not that efficient because they are not massive enough to produce stable binaries. Uh, and then we expect these binaries to have high initial eccentricities and to have isotropically oriented spins because dynamics randomizes the initial uh, spin directions of the system. And to study uh, more quantitatively the uh, dynamical evolution of binary black holes, we can use simulations uh, like this one. So here I show the mass of the secondary black hole versus the mass of the primary black hole. Uh, the yellow stars are like when Virgo uh, binary black holes for comparison. Uh, the gray contours are binary black holes that merge from simulations of isolated binary systems, so no dynamics in the gray contours, while the color markers are binary black holes that form in stellar clusters. And we can see two crucial differences between the dynamical black holes and the isolated black holes. Here you see that dynamics favors the formation of systems with unequal mass ratios, which are suppressed by isolated evolution. And second, if you look up here, dynamics favors the formation of binary black hole mergers with uh, black holes more massive than about 40 solar masses or even 60 solar masses. So we find about 
1% of binary black hole mergers with mass in the per instability mass gap. Uh, and these systems here in these simulations form via a channel that is called stellar mergers. So the idea is that uh, dynamics in a dense stellar clusters triggers collisions between stars and under some circumstances, these collisions may lead to the formation of very exotic stars with a core undersized with respect to the envelope, which may avoid per instability and collapse directly to a black hole with mass in the per instability mass gap. Is this the only scenario that can lead to the formation of black holes in the per instability mass gap with dynamics? Uh, no. There are other possible dynamical channels. So one of the most popular channels is the hierarchical merger. Uh, the idea is that I start from two smaller black holes, and when they merge, their merge remnant will be more massive. If it pairs up again with another black hole, it can merge again. And if it can pair up again, it merges again, and so on, by building a hierarchical chain of mergers. Uh, this, of course, is possible only in star clusters because the merge remnant is a single object at birth, and it needs to pair up dynamically with another companion. And an obstacle to the formation of long chains uh, is the gravitational wave recoil that the merge remnant received at birth uh, because of asymmetries in gravitational wave emission. And this recoil is of the order of hundreds of kilometers per second, so definitely larger than the escape velocity from the smaller star clusters. Uh, so here we need to study this process in the most massive star clusters, like nuclear star clusters, which lie at the center of galaxies. And here you see two different studies that uh, numerically address the hierarchical formation of black holes in nuclear star clusters. On the left, you see the maximum mass of a black hole that can form via hierarchical mergers in a nuclear star cluster as a function of the mass of the star clusters and for different metal for different sorry densities of the star cluster and of course higher masses of the star cluster and higher densities lead to uh, larger maximum masses on the right hand side you see uh, all the binary black hole mergers that take place in nuclear star clusters in a nuclear star clusters with this kind of models and the top panel shows the masses, the bottom panel, the effective spin parameters that were already mentioned yesterday. Uh, the field histograms are first generation mergers, so stellar born black holes, while the unfilled histograms are uh, second generation or a higher generation hierarchical mergers. And you see by looking at the masses that the second generation black holes completely fill the mass gap. And we find black holes with mass up to 1,000 solar masses. And we see also this very clear signature of second generation mergers in the effective, scenes para effective spin parameter, chi p, which measure the spin components in the orbital plane. So uh, the take home message for dynamically formed binaries is that we do have, we do know several dynamical formation channels that can fill or partially fill the upper mass gap, like uh, stellar collisions and hierarchical mergers of black holes in many different star classes and in the dense disks surrounding active galactic nuclei, so surrounding the central supermassive black hole of galaxies. Uh, plus, from dynamics, we expect the spin directions to be isotropically distributed, while in the isolated binary evolution, we 
have a preference for aligned spins. And now in the last few minutes, I will briefly mention our future challenges. So uh, now we are planning for the fourth observing run of current detectors, uh, but we are also uh, planning for the next generation gravitational wave detectors. And this plot here shows the instrumental horizon of current detectors and next generation detectors. The blue line shows the uh, horizon of advanced LIGO uh, at design sensitivity. And you see that LIGO will measure binary black holes only up to redshift one, two, while the green and the pink uh, regions are the horizons for the Einstein telescope in Europe and the Cosmic Explorer in the US. And they will observe binary black hole mergers up to Rashi 30 or more, which is when the universe was only 100 mega year old. So this is very exciting, uh, but this also poses a challenge. Um, we, we need to uh, try to model and understand the evolution of binary black hole mergers, binary compact object mergers. So, and especially we need to capture and quantify the main uncertainties that affect our knowledge of this evolution. So this plot that I'm showing now uh, is for isolated binaries, only isolated binary evolution. And it shows the merger rate density of binary black holes black hole neutron stars and binary neutron stars um, as a function of the look time or the cosmological redshift, uh, which mean basically the same thing that we are here and the Big Bang is somewhere on the right. Uh, and the red lines is a fixed binary evolution model. So we do not change any parameters of a binary evolution model. And the red area quantifies the uncertainties on the observation of the star formation rate, the formation of massive stars as a function of time. And the hatched area shows the uncertainty on the metallicity evolution of stars. And you see that especially for binary black holes, this uncertainty is orders of magnitude. And then we can do the same for the binary evolution process. And here we just pick up one, one free parameter, which is the efficiency of common envelope that I mentioned before. So these three, three plots are the same as before, but here we fix the star formation rate, we fix the metallicity, and we change only one parameter of binary evolution. And this is a tremendous impact on the merger rate density. And this is, of course, a big underestimate of the actual uncertainty because we are changing just one parameter instead of the many important parameters that we have, like the uh, mass transfer efficiency, the kicks, and so on. And of course, we can do the same for the dynamical channel. And uh, these two plots uh, try to quantify uh, the uncertainty on the merge rate of binary black holes from globular clusters, which is one of the most important dynamical environments. On the left, you see the binary black hole merge rate as a function of cosmic time. The different lines bracket the uncertainty on the formation history of globular clusters. So the dynamical model is the same, but we change the model based on the uncertainty on the formation of globular clusters. While in the right-hand panel, the formation history is the same, but we change the properties of the star clusters, and in particular, the central density of the star cluster. And well, you see, we have orders of magnitude uncertainties in this case too. So I'm done. Uh, let me summarize my conclusions. So the future, for the study of binary compact objects is bright, or I should say is loud, because we 
are preparing for the fourth and, and fifth observing runs of LIGO, Virgo, and CAGRA. And we are planning for the next generation detectors. Uh, but from the theoretical perspective, from the astrophysical perspective, we have a lot of work to do because the predictive power of the astrophysical models is hampered by a number of uh, crucial uncertainties um, that I try to write down here in this final slide. Uh, and this uncertainty involves stellar and binary evolution, uh, the modeling of core club supernovae, the stellar and gas dynamics, and the evolution of stars across cosmic time. So I'm done. Uh, thank you for your attention. And now I will be happy uh, to take questions.